Okay, welcome. Good morning. So today we're going to get our hands dirty with integrator data. There are a couple of specific considerations when we analyze our integrator data that are quite specific in the data that we don't have to think about as much when we analyze EEG or MMD data. One being that independent data is acquired in clinical settings for clinical purposes and not in dedicated lab settings. So that means that we get, you gotta work with the data that you get and the data comes in different shapes and sizes. Uh, for, just by the way, as Peggy explained yesterday, uh, integrating data to data mostly recorded um, to guide neurosurgery when uh, scalp EG and MRI cannot give you sufficient information for that. Some medical institutes um, make CT scans, others make MRIs, uh, some do both, so we have to work with a variety of anatomical images. Another challenge that we have is we never get the same electrode coverage in this patient, meaning you cannot use the same layout in all our analysis as we talked about yesterday. Uh, we can also not simply compute an effort of those patients, it'll be harder. The second challenge I think that is common to integrated data analysis is that we get very high spatial temporal position and signal to noise ratio. Uh, this is not just a challenge, it's actually one of the strengths of integrating with units that motivate me to use it. But it can also be challenging because we've got such high precision that combined with our unique output coverage, it's again very hard. To, uh, to compare across subjects because we're not necessarily in the exact same location in our signal are very precise. Another challenge is that the data is highly rich in information. Um, there's, it, it easily also um, blows up in terms of dimensions. So we started each off with the, um, the wall format, which has two dimensions, channels by time. So when you do time picture analysis, you guys did yesterday, you might have a third dimension than uh, the frequency, but you can also do it between channel conditions blowing up the space with four dimensions. So it grows out of proportion very quickly. So what we want actually is analyze our data in an efficient, a simple way as possible. Yet we want to have enough flexibility to overcome case specific, site specific obstacles, right? In terms of layout, in terms of everything basically. And ideally, given that our data is unique in nature, and it's relatively rare as compared to EG data sets, we want our approach to be as transparent and reproducible as possible, so that we can share the data that others can work with. So essentially what you want is go from the multitude of raw data files shown in the top here to integrated observations. As fast and efficient and simple as possible. For instance, you might want to be able to explore the data, uh, as you did yesterday, um, like this. Creating two time frequency for each channel, and then uh, average over a bunch of channels. Now to explore it, say, oh, there's, there's high down benefit they don't have these channels. That's where that's coming from. And this, of course, is way more efficient than having to you know, script every possible uh, option. Um, we do it for the low frequency bands. So this is the tool that allows you to um, explore the data in a totally informed way. What I find interesting about this specific data is that you have the high gamma band increases, but not necessarily the same location as low frequency decreases, which is something <coughs> I, I thought was not was kind of counterintuitive. Uh, you might also want to explore the data in a more anatomically realistic manner. Uh, something like this. Same, same with the data that you guys are going to work with this morning. Uh, the subject has to press a button upon hearing a target tone. So if you see that there's some auditory activation spreading to motor cortex. Uh, alternatively, you want to explore your depth probe data. Um, this is you don't see the brain here. So I've got, I've got the hip caps here on both sides, and I have the glass in the front. You can see, the, yeah, you see some spread of activity going from one hip campus to the other. Uh, this is raw signal, um, so you can imagine that for clinical purposes, it's very convenient to see how the seizure spreads 
across these deeper structures. So yesterday we have basically covered this part already. We have talked about activity analysis and how they pre-process your data. That's what we did yesterday morning. Today we're going to talk about the anatomical workflow. And also we'll, what we'll see is that this anatomical workflow is actually integrated with the functional workflow. For instance, when we will do our electrode placement, we will be able to incorporate electrode labels from the real reporting files, allow us to directly assign electrode locations to a label, which makes a integration uh, almost seamless. And as you'll see, we will be able to, it's very easy to get that information back to the functional workflow. So what I'm trying to say is that the two workflows are really well integrated, and that should hopefully reduce you know, the chance of human error. And, uh, and make it very easy, actually. So what are the anatomical data that we can expect to work with? Um, in the past, what we would see is uh, surgical photos or x-rays. What we see nowadays is uh, three three-dimensional images, including an MRI and a CT. The MRI is used or usually made to you know, detect uh, or identify the structural abnormalities. Uh, it's also useful for guiding the surgical implantation when the decision is made to actually implant that approach. Then there's the CT, post implant CT, which is actually made after implantation. And um, it basically shows high intensity objects in the scan, including the skull and uh, the electrodes. However, it doesn't show any soft tissue. Um, there's barely any brain structure or any brain anatomy visible, which is visible actually in the preamp <coughs> MRI. So in order to get anatomical context, in order to see the relationship between our electrodes and the brain anatomy, we have to fuse them, and that way we're able to link the electrodes to this brain anatomy. Yeah, one, I also need to uh, quickly note that sometimes we get post implant MRIs, like in our case, in my lab, we get them usually only from turbines and not from every hospital that we work with. So these are relatively rare. But in a sense, they provide the ground truth because they give you both electrodes and anatomy. Right? So uh, it's hard to see, but the, here is an electrode grid, and there are depth probes going in from both sides to the target hippocampus. And what can happen, especially when you get into cranianomy, is that there's the pressure changes for this is called the subdural hydroma, which might press the tissue inward and together with the electrodes. This is actually this phenomenon is called the grave shift. And it's quite common with uh, operations that involve the cranianomy, it's less common with uh, operations that involve the verbal that they was talking about yesterday, or inserting death probes. And of course, you know, but you still remember the last time I was fusing the two scans. So in the CT, the electrodes will be here, whereas in our pre MRI, our anatomy will be here. So what could happen is that your electrodes, after the fusion, appear buried in the cortex. Um, in the rare case that you have a post implant MRI, you could also decide to do the localization of this scan if you want, because in a way it's a ground truth. Um, what happens here is that the electrodes appear dark, so if they're depth probes, it's hard to see, but you can see these voids here, these dark voids. That's why our electrodes are. That's the reason isn't great, but uh, you could localize electrodes, you retrieve them. It's harder for grid electrodes, actually, because those grid electrodes are surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid, which also appears dark in scan. So it's hard to dissociate electrodes from, from CSF. Okay, let's start with our. Um, pipeline. Um, we have to talk about coordinate systems. And you don't have to remember everything that I tell you in this slide, but just to give you a sense of what might be going on and uh, how we are how we solved it in our case. The issue is that most of the scans we get, or all scans, right, is that we don't know what their coordinate system is. And why is this relevant? Well, some coordinate systems might be um, Pretty idiosyncratic. For instance, you could have a coordinate system where the x-axis runs from the left ear to the right ear, but you could also have another scale where maybe the x-axis runs anterior. 
And if you want to fuse the two scans, you're not getting the MRI and the CT. You want this, you want the two scans to be in the same coordinates, otherwise you cannot fuse them. So before we do anything else with our scans, we want to make sure that we know what the coordinates is, how it behaves, what it's like. Actually, what we are going to do, we are going to impose the coordinates. We're going to make sure that they are, they are in the same coordinates. Now, you don't have to remember everything about coordinate systems. All you've got to know is that these three steps, and that we have a function at the determined coordinate system, which allows you to plot the, uh, the anatomic image in a 3D context. I will show you what it looks like. And then the second step is to define which axis defines the left right axis. And then the third step is does that axis go from the left to right, from right to left. And the, the whole reason for doing this is that when you want to figure out where the right hemisphere is in our patient. Because we are going to uh, align or realign our scan to the new coordinate system. And most of the landmarks that we will be selecting are relatively unambiguous, but the right hemisphere is easy to find to have a left right flip. So we need more context to figure out what the right hemisphere is. I'll show you what that looks like. So this is our if you run up the determined courses and this is the figure you get, you can see that this axis here is the left right axis. And it's really small, but there's a plus sign here, which is a minus sign here. So we know it runs from left to right. Okay, that's all we need to know from this. Now we have that information. I, I very shortly. Yeah. Okay, can you go back one slide? Yeah, sure. So, so, the, so this is a figure in the field trip, uh, which we'll also be baking later this morning. Uh, but the convention that we're using here is a convention that you actually see in a lot of software programs, which is that you see a red, a green, and a blue axis. The red one is the x-axis, the green one is the uh, y-axis, and the blue one is the z-axis. So it's, it's... I believe you're on by I've never noticed. Oh, yeah, I didn't call it by I don't notice. And that's also why I wanted to highlight it. <laughs> but it, it, it's just, just it's, it's, it's relevant so that you can quickly recognize this and also the similarity between different software packages that, that basically deal with the same problem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our MI in ACPC space. Um, it's just a coordinate system, and it's actually a preferred convention for the free server step that we're using next, but that's why we chose the ACPC system. And we need to find four landmarks, the anterior commissure, AC, and the posterior commissure. On top of that, we're also selecting a, I'll show you that here, oh, before I show you that. Uh, this is the tool we're using, actually volume realign, we'll be using it a few times today. And this is our target coordinate system, ACPC. These are the four landmarks. Schematically, uh, anterior commissure, posterior commissure, our right hemisphere port, for which we needed every previous step. And we'll be finding a midline point uh, in the positive direction. So four landmarks what we're going to, to highlight. Uh, you call it the bottom real line about this figure. Let's start with our right hemisphere port. Um, it's hard to see. But there, it says minus 43 here. Let's we click on this side. It says plus 50 for the x-axis. And we know that our, our left-right axis runs from left to right. So that means that this is the right hemisphere. So we can hit the R on the keyboard, and we'll put a landmark guard there. Next up, we are selecting the anterior commissure. Basically, it's a, a wire track that connects the two hemispheres in the front. And when you find the, the <coughs> keyboard, then the posterior comes here. Another wire track, wire track that connects the hemispheres in the back. And finally, made by point. Okay, so you want to check in your command window where, you, where you've got coordinates for all four landmarks. And when you do, you can close the figure and you have your, your scan is now in the ACPC coordinate system. Okay. Uh, you can now give your 
scan you want it to, it's optional. It's a free server. <coughs> One of the benefits of free servers is that it creates these very nice field surfaces. It's great for plotting data. Um, free server does a, a lot of things actually with your, with your data. With your mind scan, it pauses. Uh, and besides the cortical service extraction, it also uh, aligns your scan to a template based on the uh, cortical verification pattern. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's convenient if you want to do group level analysis or compare electrode position across subject basically. And these are also helps you with that. I'm not going to talk more about this right now. Um, this is the only, this whole pipeline together would take like an hour, but this thing, this operation, takes 10 hours, so it's a fully automatic thing. So that's why we have places right in the beginning, as soon as you have done MRI, you can just get it straight to the free server. And we can move on then to the free process of our anatomical CT. Again, here, we want to know what the left-right axis is. But actually, in our subject, we know that we have a left, or we have a grip on the left parietal cortex and temporal cortex. So actually, already this subject, this CT, we already know what the left hemisphere is, so it's easy that we have to know the right hemisphere. So actually, we don't have to do this step before we try to get our CT scan also in the ACPC coin system. There's actually, a, actually another issue, though. Does anyone see it? Remember, we're trying to get, I'm trying to bring this CT scan down to the ACPC coordinate system. But good luck finding the anterior comes here, posterior comes here, because there's no gray anatomy in CT, of course. So, what we're we doing instead, we are going to, we are going to get here, but we are going to go to the network coordinate system first, the CTF coordinate system. And this coordinate system is useful for our scan because it revolves selection of the nation pointing at the root of your nose, the left and right ear canals, and your midline port. So that's relatively easy to mark even in a CT scan. Uh, again, using one real line, this time it's using the port in the CTF. Yeah. Um, sorry, so the reason we're doing this is because the brain has shifted a lot? We're doing this coordinate system? This is still independent of that. So this is, we'll get to that, mm -hmm. how to compensate for the brain shift. This is just to get the CT aligned or fused with MRI so that the electrodes will have a location in the corresponding to the brain anatomy. Okay. So just to be clear, the only overlapping aspects of the CT and MRI are uh, the skull tissue, basically, sort the of surrounding skull and scalp tissue. Mm -hmm. So how the fusion process is going to work is not based on brain anatomy, but on, uh, on the skull and the scalp tissue. Mm -hmm. So it's going to align the scan so that the electrodes will appear, will be visible in the MRI scan as well. You know where they are. Because so now they're in different systems still. So we don't know, if, if I click a point in the CT, it's not matched necessarily to the same point in the MRI. So that's, that's why we first bring them in the same coordinate system, then we're going to fuse them, and then we have a hoping agreement between the location of the electrodes and the brain underneath. And the reason you're using two different coordinate systems is because they're specific to the type of the scan? So like the ACPC is specific to the MRI? To the yeah. MRI? Okay. Uh, well, okay. the ACPC system is a preferred convention for our food server stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, the lab have to scan ACPC coordinate systems. So that's what we chose that. It actually, you can have any, you can even take your MRI and bring it to the CDF, CDF system and you can even fuse the two scans when you're both in the CTF coordinate system, that's possible as long as they're in the same coordinate system. Mm -hmm. But ACPC is, yeah, uh, it's favorable, favorable because of the future step. Uh, yeah. AC, ACPC is for the yeah, coordinate system that is linked with its origin at the anterior commissure is also used for the MNI, uh, the Atlas brain, it's used in the SPM, it's used in APNI. Uh, it's, it's basically used it's in a lot of um, functional imaging software. So a lot of results uh, in literature are reported relative to the anterior commissura. Um, so that's why that is an interesting, or the, why the AC and the PC are interesting landmarks to attach a quadrant system to the to the head. Whereas in um, in EEG or in MEG, we often start with recordings where we don't have imaging data. So we often start with anatomical landmarks that are on the outside of the head. So we, we usually palpate the, the three auricular points and the nasian and the inian to determine where to put the electrodes in the EEG 
and with the MEG we put the head localizer coils there. So with, with the EEG and MEG, because we don't always have imaging data, we have to use external landmarks, whereas if you have imaging data, it is preferred to use internal landmarks, because I actually don't care about the skull per se, but you care about the brain. Um, and here Ian is explaining that we, that we can use both. So on one hand, we're using ACPC because that's, that forms a nice bridge towards a uh, free surfer. But on the other hand, the external landmarks, such as used with the CTF MEG system, which are the ears and the nose, they also work quite nicely, and they work quite well both in the CT and in, uh, and in the anatomical MRI. And just one more follow-up. Um, although we are be doing, getting each subject in ACPC space, it doesn't mean that they that are directly comparable still, um, because you still you can't have it be scaled yet to so match each other. That's another step we'll talk about later. Um, it's called polynomialization, where you're, you're scaling the geometry of your brain so it, so it fits a template brain. And if you do that for all subjects, then you basically every brain, you can basically go from one location, one way to the other, uh, to the same location in another way. Uh, that's not here yet, but we'll get to that. That's the, what's called spatial normalization. Um, okay, these are the four landmarks that you have to be selected. Uh, right here for now, uh, we are a pre orbital point. For the left here, the nation and the uh, midline again. So that's down here. We know that where the grid is, is our left hemisphere. So I'm selecting the left pre uh, orbital point here. I hit L on the keyboard. Do the same for the right. R, and nation, which is at the root of your nose right here. And finally our fourth point. Check. There you have all coordinates here for all landmarks, nation, left, right, Z. And now your CTS, oh sorry, your CT scan is in CTF space. It's not an ACPC space yet, but you can call up the convert core system, we'll do a dramatic <coughs> conversion. And there's you get your CTS input in CTF space. <coughs> this is your target coordinate system, and you'll get your CTI in ACPC space. Okay, so now that our scans are pre-processed, we can start fusing them. Um, for that, we use the avoid realign again. This time we give both CT and then rise input. And actually here, I chose to use the freezer for MRI because it's a nice and polished version, but it's just the same MRI. Um, I like the SPM method so far. I think Richie, you can probably confirm that. I think they have never failed on any Procedure for right? as we have under the always works fine. If, you, if it doesn't work because you have a strange case, there are all kinds of tools that you could try this in your cell or all kinds of SPM algorithms. But the standard SPM 12 rigid body transformation gives us gives you a very good result in, in a fraction of time, really. Um, Cortex system, it's a PC. Um, this option is optional, view result. If you specify yes, you get this figure. And what it is is basically your CT scan and the MRI scan uh, plot on top of each other. The CT scan is indicated in blue, and uh, the, the soft tissue of the MRI is indicated in red. And what you're looking for here is to, to look for tight interlocking between the high intensity tissue of the CT and the soft tissue of the MRI. So you want your the grid, your skull, um, to be in between the anatomy and the, and the scalp capture it with the MRI. And the best thing to do is just play the bit around in, in, the, in the board around the borders to see if, the, if there's a tight match. But it's just, usually it looks like even if you have a left right flip, which you know kind of cases occur if you have control for it carefully, uh, you might spot it at this step. You might see that you have it, it fits not, not nicely here on the, on the edges. Uh, despite that from a distance it looks like they're overlapped. Um, 
So this is a critical step, it's a control step for, for all the procedures uh, until now. Okay, now we can move on to our electrode placement step, where we start localizing the electrodes in the CD. For that, you use FT electrode placement. Um, you can give, you have to give your D, you might have options or you want to give if you want, want to talk over to your two scans. And what you see here, what I'm actually doing, I'm reading the header of our recording file here. So I'm taking that information, header here, and I take the channel information, which is stored in header label, and I give that as input at the actual placement. What will happen is that the actual labels will appear as a to-do list in our actual placement tool. Uh, it's hard to see, but they will appear in this list here, which is useful to do this, of course. And secondly, it also allows you to directly link in a conversation a location to a uh, neural recording label. So you no longer have to sort or rename electrodes afterward after doing one session. It's directly integrated. Okay, so this is what that looks like. If you run a electrode session, it will a figure like that, this actually. You can change the brightness of the scan. And now it's just a matter of finding the output. You cannot even see. Oh, there's a list of other labels right here. So RM1 and 2 would be the right amygdala in this patient. If you would death rows, number one is the deepest electrode. For grids, you need you need to have a uh, notes from the uh, from from the surgery. Uh, and then you can toggle between the CT and MRI scan. They're already fused, so you can maybe go from one to the other. Uh, you can also create a scatter figure. Uh, for more three-dimensional context, this is especially useful if you want to localize other types of grids. Because they don't won't be necessarily aligned with the slices here. Uh, it's easier and you can click out what's in there doing that. Uh, the corresponding label in your list. This is probably the most laborious procedure of the entire uh, <coughs> pipeline. It's, I think, on average, somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. And the output is an ELEC structure, which has the labels. Match to the actual positions. Right, so here two workloads become already confused, and, um, and this is your result here. Output. Okay, I already mentioned a few times um, it's possible to use the recording labels from here in the electro placement, seamlessly fusing the two workloads, but it's also possible to <coughs> get the output, the electro structure you just got, back to your function analysis, and that's what I'm doing here. So this is data uh, coming from pre-processing purposes. If I just say data dot elect is elect, where elect is the output from your electrode placement step, then uh, what will happen is the filter will keep your electrode structure consistent with the neural data uh, going forward in terms of your analysis. For instance, you want to do a re-referencing, for instance, bipolar re-referencing step, and you specify CMG dot update census yes. You won't, won't not just not apply the uh, the polar derivation to your neural data, but your electrode structure will also become updated. For instance, um, with a bipolar scheme, that typically involves creating a spatial average um, between two electrodes and these two electrodes are used for the bipolar derivation. And that way, you never have to worry about uh, adjusting the electrode structure yourself or figuring it out. And uh, just keep it consistent. And once you get to the point of plotting your data, for instance here, what this will do is read the data, the neural data, find the corresponding outer positions that are uh, kept and consistent with the data, and the plotting will be very easy. You don't have to worry about the match uh, between the neural data and the atomical data. Okay, um, I think I've covered the basics so far of the pipeline. There are a few more things I want to talk about. Um, are there any questions to this point? Yeah. So, um, so filter would automatically recognize which electrodes are the closest together, and, and it would use those to do the bipolar referencing. Yeah, that's the question. I didn't. I want to say about that. Um, no, it won't. Um, 
what it will do, so if you specify a ref method bipolar, that is actually a consecutive uh, linkage. So if you give it a death row, for instance, you call this just for death row, and you have, uh, say, RAM1 to 8, mm -hmm. it will create bipolar parent automatically for one RAM1 and 2, RAM2 and 3, etc. Uh, if you want to do more complex stuff, you want to have more control of the thing, like Rob was explaining yesterday, yeah. you can use FD apply montage, create your own montage, and, and tell future of yourself which electrodes you want to uh, form or pair together. Or if you want to do something more complex, like, uh, I don't know, but it, you can also say direct method uh, average, that would just do like for a grid, a whole average uh, uh, grid market. That doesn't, that's the station I said, but when you do a common average reference, you actually don't need to make other uh, drug decisions. So you don't have to call it to make sense. So, so far, it only applies for something like a bipolar derivation, where bipolar is only based on the consecutive order of the input. So just a, if you do yeah. a situation where your electrodes are not nicely sorted, mm -hmm. then you have to be careful, because you could maybe, you know, be pairing RM8 with RM1. Right. So if that's the case, you want to create your own montage. So, so, so something that we do quite often uh, is that, is that the, since the data is in the single recording file, we pre-process the data once and we want to apply the same filters to all the channels. But then subsequently we might want to do specific steps on parts of the data, for example on the shards and not on the grids. So then we, you can also use FT select data to split your raw data into multiple subsets of channels then you can process a, su a subset of channels according to a specific way, so you can use an average reference for a grid, and you can use a bipolar reference for a shaft, then you can use FT append data to, to merge the data again. So okay. if, you, if you think of this as in an analysis pipeline, we're basically we're taking a pre-processing, we're using FT select data to split it in multiple streams, then we're doing the, the data type specific, or the, the electrode specific processing, then we're appending it again, so we're, we're merging the data again. Yeah, the tutorial wants to be doing that. So yeah. Okay. Then I want to talk about a little bit about range of conversation, where we discussed a little bit today. Um, no spatial conversation, which techniques are different support. And finally, I want to talk about uh, atom labeling. So we already discussed the concept of it. So the idea that if you fuse a a post implant. Uh, image with a pre implant image that uh, if the electrodes are here in a post implant situation, which you don't know about when you have a CT, you don't know about any game shift, that they will appear buried in your pre implant scan. So instead of seeing something like this, which is what you expect, that to have the grip lay on top of the cortex, it now appears buried on the inside cortex. Other this occurrence supports two techniques out there that are trying to project back the grid to the cortex. And both techniques rely on the creation of a cortical hull, which is basically a smooth outline of, of this cortical tissue. So one technique is called, created uh, by uh, Pixar, 2012. And what this technique does, it tries to back project the grid taking into account inter-electrode distances, so it tries to keep those consistent, while at the same time reducing the overall distance of the grid to the cortical uh, hall. So this, this algorithm uses an optimization step where it tries to, try to find uh, minima in terms of solutions and uh, preserving the overall geometry of the grid as much as possible. By the way, you might ask why, why actually creating a cortical hole? Um, what, why we are creating it is you want any inward place electrodes not to be projected to a nearby cortical cell side when you back project it, but back to where supposedly the grid was laid. So you don't want it to end up in a nearby cell side. The second technique that is supported is created by Dora Hermes. Um, this technique doesn't preserve doesn't look at inter electrode distance, but it computes the local norm vector of the grid. So it takes electrode positions, creates a local norm vector, and then it projects electrodes along the direction of norm vector to the, to the cortical hull. 
Uh, and you can you can toggle between the two settings by uh, stretch out different inputs and see if you work when you call that central real. Uh, Can you comment on why you would use one or the other? Oh, yeah. um, <coughs> it's possible with this technique that you, you get stuck in the local mailing that's not optimal. So we've had that. Um, or for some reason, the well, here we indicated that the pairing of electrodes, something could go wrong in the pairing. For instance, the so we have, we have made some modifications of this technique, but by default, it would just look for, you know, if you search what, the, what are my neighbors, nearest neighbors. But if it, the grid, say, fold around the, the temple low, for instance, it's possible that you get a strange pairing, and that's going to wrinkle your grid uh, during the back projection. So long story short, it's possible you don't, you don't get an optimal solution with this one. And when that happens, so this would be to be both to this one by default, but you try to preserve the grid, you can challenge as much as possible. Then we, then we resort to this guy. Um, both techniques give you spatial error of about 3 million years. So they have quantified as compared to uh, surgical photography, photography, see where that goes should have been, and see where that goes are after that projection. So you get some errors there, but it's way less important than you have uh, that goes really bare inside the cortex. <clears throat> Sorry if I missed it, but uh, is there a point there uh, where you could get like pre and post scans and compute like the shift using, I don't know, the Jacobian or something of like a nonlinear registration of the two brains? Like, is that part of this or no? No, I think you could do that actually, yeah. Um, however, that would not work with a CT because you don't have the anatomy, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, with post implant, you could maybe try to. Do a nonlinear transformation of the two T ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's possible. And then you can do this with um, at the either at the volume real line or maybe at the volume normalization, which I'll show the next slide, will allow you to do a nonlinear transformation scan. But that of course only works if you have a positive and one mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Any more questions on bridge conversation really? Is that clear? Um and let's talk about spatial normalization. There are all kinds of techniques out there that can be broadly categorized into either a volume-based registration-based normalization or a surface-based registration. If you want to do the, the volume-based registration, you call FD volume uh, normalize, where you get the MRI, and then you get the MRI and then night space. You get a transformation matrix. From this step that you can apply to the electrode, that will become clear in the order how to do that. But essentially, what it does, it takes your, uh, your, your brain, actually, your MRI, and it tries to scale the geometry of your brain so that it matches the template. And you can use linear and nonlinear transformations. Uh, there are all kinds of algorithms out there, but that's roughly what all the steps are going to come. Does it do that like just on the whole brain level, or does it do it like? Oh, I can see sulca, the sulcus here, or like the temporal lobe, for example. So I'm going to blow it up independently of like the frontal lobe. Um, I think it depends on um, which uh, subparameters you specify. So okay. it, it, like, it might preserve the geometry like big uh, lobes, yeah. for instance, that have overlap with the template. Yeah. But the finer structure of the, 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 the finer cortical verification might get lost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It, it, this is again something where we're uh, relying on the developments of other software packages such as SPM, so we're using SPM under the boot. Mm -hmm. uh, but we make we made a lack of wrapper to make it more easily accessible so that we can keep the data in the future representation. Okay. Do you have another question? Oh, yeah. um, is the template specifically or how is the template? Um, by default, you use an SPM template, which is uh, in MLI space, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that every subject in line will also end, end up in MLI space. There's a benefit to that, that most atlases are also represented in MNI space. So once you do this step, you can also look up the anatomical label of your electrodes in all kinds of atlases. I'll actually get that to the next slide on that. But it supports eight different atlases. Uh, so getting him here allows you actually to look up uh, electrodes in actually six of those eight. The other two are each of these atlases, so we don't talk about it now. Okay, then the, the alternative 
is actually free service, service-based registration. Uh, each server creates a, a, a basically a lookup table um, that we use for getting our electrodes to the template brain. But the crucial bit here is it tries to get the electrodes to the template based on the critical verification pattern of your subject. So it doesn't care about overall geometry, it only cares about what is the portable verification. Meaning that if you have an electrode somewhere near a central focus, it will also appear on the central surface of your template brain. And it doesn't necessarily preserve the overall geometry of the grid, as you can see, right? It's quite distorted. Uh, but it will be matched in terms of the, uh, the curvature patterns of your cortex. Uh, to use this technique, you specify a uh, work that is average, and you uh, use that you can show real item. Let me show you this in action. This is how I used it on my own data. Um, <coughs> What I was doing here was localizing um, peaks of alpha band and beta band activity. So you have subject one, subject two, lots of alpha actually in the posterior to the central surface, as you can see here. Um, beta is actually on top of the central surface in all my subjects. And um, testing the algorithm, I brought every electrode in the group level to the test one. And as you can see, it all alpha electrodes appeared massive on the post central virus. Whereas all beta electrodes were on top of the central surface. But this works really well for getting one, um, yeah, for, for mapping electrodes from one brain to another, considering just the uh, curvature pattern of the cortex. So theoretically, my central surface would be somewhere all the way in the back, like maybe idiosyncratic anatomy, and this technique will try to preserve that and actually get it. My other one will be here, actually on my central surface here, but on template will be here. Whereas the other technique, the bottom version of the will not take that into account. So these are probably the two differences between the two techniques. And of course, it all depends on what you're, what you're trying to make inferences about uh, which technique you should use. OK, finally, uh, anatomical label. Um, if you wanted to do it, you use that. You specify a, you call it the bottom lookup, where you give a CFD.ROI region of interest. Um, you can give an electrode coordinate to it, a channel position. And what you also give to it is an atlas, get right in using activity atlas. And what it will do, it will create a structure called labels with all the labels of the atlas and the count for how many times the atlas was found for that electrode or how many electrodes. So uh, if you're in a certain region, you will see a 1 and, uh, in the region that overlap with the location of the electrode and zeros for all the electrodes and atlases. And you can do this for all of your electrodes and for all eight atlases. Now, to, to save everybody time writing the exact same code, we create a little helper function, uh, generate a flag table. Yeah, there's a download in the tutorial, it's not in the future. And basically, what it does is exactly just that. Just loops across all, you know, you just give it your index structure, your output file name, and it will just read all the atlases from, from field tip, field tip, and it will spit out, it will spit out something like this. And, uh, an electrode table that you can use for your analysis. So, for instance, for this subject, we have, I only showed this the four entries because this, the table is huge, but you have your electrode label here, uh, left. Uh, uh, temporal grid, one, four, et cetera. And coordinates, this, these are just that we use in our, uh, in our, in our in the night web. Uh, decisions that we make on the central, like where we start the central, where we consider the galactic. Just some notes, our localization meeting notes we have here. And here, this, this entry is uh, just the output for each atlas. Uh, so it will give you, for instance, the AFNI gave us a hit for the middle temple jars. 100% here means that. Our search, like you can define a search um, sphere, was fully in the middle temple yard, so we had 100% overlap. Um, but some analysis, are, some, some are different, they also get different outputs. A gray map will tell you whether it's gray or white matter, for instance. Um, I think this is Sabine Cancer's lab, Atlas, that's more focused on dried up cortex, visual cortex. Well, these are the two actually uh, research analyses. So they, those are based on a um, 
search the registration or DRD are based on the volume based registration. And of course, this, we hope that this can help you guys with uh, grouping electrodes, for instance, uh, from different subjects based on the anatomy. <coughs> and I know Ignacio has been doing this. Um, he's compared, for instance, uh, medial holding control to cortical electrodes with lateral holding control to by grouping electrodes from different subjects. And I think he's already found an interesting time to use the approach. So it seems, uh, seems pretty cool. Okay, let's wrap up this presentation. We've talked about the pre-processing of the MRI and CT, how to fuse the two, then how to place electrodes in CT, and finally we've also talked about brain shift compensation, spatial compensation, and anatomical labeling. And all this, this anatomical workflow, is a one-time procedure for a subject. And as we saw, what we've seen, it's seamlessly integrated with the functional workflow, right? We're taking out the labels for electrode placement and we're giving the electrode back to our functional analysis pipeline. Um, so that hopefully reduces the chances of human error and effort <coughs> in one work environment. We don't, before we had to use a combination of proprietary software, which we can just do all this on that time. And uh, finally, I think it's scriptable. Um, if you do it for one subject, you can use your script and run other subjects, uh, run for other subjects. It's quite useful if you script it because then it takes you by the hand by automatically, you know, uh, calling as the electrode placement element. So it's, it's very convenient that way, I think. And yeah, reproducible, what I mean with that is that just like with all fields of operations, the CSG inputs are kept with the data. So whenever I get an electrode file from you guys, uh, I can quickly look at it and see what, what happened to it. Or I can share my data with you. Uh, it's such a useful given the uniqueness of our data and uh, how scarce it is.